So, yeah, the, 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 the subject of the talk is clear enough from the title, the Homeric contribution to skepticism, but I thought it might be worth um, starting out just situating this a bit in relation to a couple of other papers and projects that I've been uh, working on, um, make, make more sense of what's going on here. Um, one paper that uh, is already available in, in a German translation is, um, called Does Every philosophy, Genuine Philosophy Have a Skeptical Side? And in that paper I was interested in pursuing really an idea from Hegel that in some fashion or another it belongs to the very nature of philosophy to be uh, in part or in one aspect or in one moment as you might say, skeptical. Uh, in, in, in an ancient context, the thought was that uh, if you look at uh, the various forms of philosophy, they all turn out to be either types of skepticism or types of anti-skepticism. That's, that's not, and that's not a trivial claim. I mean, anti-skepticism doesn't, doesn't just mean not skepticism. It means acting against or reacting against skepticism. And um, so that was the, the subject of that paper, and I think a very good case can be made for that thesis, and in particular, the, the, the hardest-looking case, Aristotle, who's sometimes read as kind of just uninterested in or uninformed about skepticism, turns out, on the contrary, when you look closely, to have not just the peripheral interest in skeptical issues that sometimes been discussed in the literature, but to be absolutely centrally concerned to address forms of skeptical attack on beliefs. Um, and so that's one project. And the other project is um, a paper with the title, Does Western Philosophy Have Non-Western Roots? Where I went back to uh, a debate in 19th century writing on the history of philosophy, particularly between uh, Ed Edward Zeller, who's well known, and uh, another uh, historian of philosophy who's much west, less well known, in fact hardly known at all these days, called Edouard uh, Roert. And the debate there had to do with whether philosophy as a discipline um, is, is uh, distinctively Western, in particular had its roots, its beginnings in Greece alone, or whether it had uh, Eastern roots in particular. And uh, Edward Roert makes a fascinating case that actually the latter answer is the right one, and um, that in particular important uh, early Greek philosophers, Thales and Pythagoras are the prime examples, uh, drew important thoughts from uh, Egypt, from Pharaonic Egypt. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really uh, 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 quite a, a, a startling um, uh, uh, debate to pursue and, and to realize that this is really a serious question and that that might be the answer. And, um, but one of the things that uh, emerges from that, I think, is that the philosophical ideas that you can make a, a plausible case came from uh, Pharaonic Egypt. Uh, ideas about the soul, um, the afterlife, metempsychosis of the soul, um, ideas about the constitution of the world, whether it's made up of waters, daily sort, things like this. That skepticism is not part of this background, and that one of the things that's really quite striking is that when the, this impulse gets taken over by the Greeks, skepticism becomes very much part of the story. So that's, that's part of the background to this paper. One of the most uh, striking features of Greek philosophy, and indeed of Greek culture more broadly, is the development of various forms of skepticism in a very broad sense of the term. This distinguishes them, for example, from the Egyptian and near e other Near Eastern sources, which may well have stimulated the earliest emergence of philosophy in Greece. It seems to me that this feature of Greek philosophy and culture can, to a considerable extent, be traced back to Homer. Accordingly, in this uh, paper, I'd like to discuss the roots of two very different forms of skepticism in Homer also the way in which they're already uh, uh, um, 
prepared or is it prepared for perhaps in Homer will differ significantly. What I'll call um, on the one hand philosophical skepticism and on the other hand literary skepticism um, where the literary, uh, uh, these are really just labels in particular literary skepticism um, is not about literature, it uh, has its home mainly in literature and it's not non-philosophical in a, um, any important sense, it's just that literary authors had these philosophical ideas uh, mainly rather than the philosophers. So let me begin with philosophical skepticism and here we're, we'll be in generically familiar territory for philosophers' interest in skepticism. A cursory survey of the texts that survived from the archaic period of Greece might suggest that the culture of that period lacked any clear epistemology or general theory of knowledge at all. It might also seem an attractive inference from such a supposed fact that it was in part just for this reason that the Greeks were vulnerable to skepticism when it arose. However, I'd like here to propose a quite contrary picture, that the culture of the archaic period as reflected in the poets Homer and Hesiod actually had a rather clear epistemology and that ironically, the culture was set up for skepticism. It was a skepticism just waiting to happen, as it were, precisely because it had the epistemology in question. In other words, that it would have been much less vulnerable to skepticism had it possessed no epistemology at all, but instead merely made claims about this and that without having any general theory concerning how the information involved was known. So let's begin by considering the archaic epistemology in question as it occurs in Homer and Hesiod. And it consists of two broad principles. First of all, human beings can indeed possess some knowledge by means of their own powers alone, but only concerning matters of which either they themselves or their more or less immediate acquaintances who can serve them as witnesses, have personally had sense experience. Accordingly, the epics of Homer are full of representations of everyday cases in which people know things based on their own experience, who this warrior is, what that weapon is, and so on and so forth. Um, although such judgments are by no means infallible, for example, the Trojans famously mistake Patroclus for Achilles, they're usually reliable, in general they're reliable. And concerning knowledge via one's acquaintances, this can on occasion even extend as far as it does in Iliad Book 20, where Aeneas says to Achilles, quote, we know each other's lineage and parents, hearing the words of mortal men which have been handed on successively by word of mouth. That actually goes further in the uh, 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 um, I, 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 in the chain, as it were, of uh, sources than Homer typically goes, but it's uh, 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 an extreme case that's sort of informative in a way. Secondly, so that's one principle. Secondly, however, this still leaves a vast domain concerning which human beings cannot achieve knowledge through their own powers alone, including in particular the future, Recall that there was no predictive science to speak of at this period. By, by this period, I mean roughly 8th century BC when Homer's writing. The past, insofar as it extends beyond one's own experience and that of one's acquaintances. Recall that there was little or no writing, record keeping, history, or archaeology at this period. And the nonsensible sphere, that's to say, the sphere of the Olympian gods in their normal, nonsensible forms. And in this case, in all three temporal modalities, past, present, and future. In order to know anything about any of these matters, human beings are entirely dependent on inspiration by the gods. For example, in a fairly comprehensive statement of this picture near the beginning of the Iliad, uh, this is in book one, Homer says of the divinely inspired prophet Calchas 
that he, quote, had knowledge of all things that were and that were to be and that had been before. So, in other words, um, future and past. And Homer then shows Calchas communicating information about Apollo's current purposes. So there we have the gods. This is a little par passage that encapsulates this naive epistemology, this aspect of it. And concerning knowledge of the remote past, more specifically, as the one component of it, of this, this view, Homer, already early in the Iliad, book two, calls on the muses to provide him with such knowledge, namely a list of the contingents of the Greeks who went to Troy in ancient times, saying, uh, just as he begins the famous catalog of ships, Tell me now, you, ye muses that have dwelling, dwellings on Olympus, for ye are goddesses and are at hand and know all things, whereas we hear but a rumor and know not, not anything, who were the captains of the Danans and their lords? In another comprehensive attribution of a grasp of these several types of knowledge to inspiration by the gods, Hesiod says at the start of the Theogony, that the muses, quote, breathed into me a divine voice to celebrate things that shall be and things that were aforetime, and they bade me sing of the race of the blessed gods that are eternally. Right, there you have a lovely nugget with all three of these components that you need to rely on the divine, on divine inspiration for, particularly by the muses here. According to the archaic conception of things, the specific sources and cha channels of such divine inspiration were quite diverse. They included, besides the muses with their poets, and Apollo with prophets such as Calchas, also divinely steered bird flight and other animal behavior, which could be read by talented prophets, meteorological phenomena such as lightning, dreams, oracles, and so on and so forth. So there's a quite a diverse picture about the exact channels of divine inspiration. But the crucial point is that according to the archaic conception, where questions about the future, the remote past, or the Olympian gods are concerned, human beings, unless they enjoy divine inspiration through one or another of these sources and channels, hear but a rumor and know nothing. It's already a skeptical aspect to that position, right? Now, concerning the irony I mentioned earlier, that, namely that it was precisely the fact that there was this epistemology that made skepticism a likely next step, the point to note is that precisely because the archaic period had this naive two-part epistemology covering all domains of knowledge, only two steps were required in order to plunge archaic culture into complete skepticism. First of all, an undermining of faith in the reliability of sense, sense experience as a source, source of knowledge. And secondly, an undermining of faith in the reliability of divine inspiration as a source of knowledge. In other words, in order to generate a complete skepticism, there was no need to launch an attack on the myriad individual claims to knowledge or supposed types of knowledge severally, which would have been a huge and difficult task. Simply by attacking these two supports, the whole edifice of knowledge could be brought down. So it's not so ironic after all, and it's not so surprising after all that the irony I mentioned uh, was true. It seems to me that both of these steps were in fact taken by pre-Socratic philosophy, with the result that skepticism was henceforth a very natural option for Greek culture. And it seems to me that the first person to take both steps and to advocate a sort of complete skepticism was Xenophanes, uh, the philosopher who flourished, uh, as to say, was in his prime roughly. Um, around 530 BC. Um, I'm going to here try and explain, you know, how Xenophanes took this step, exploited this vulnerability in the Homeric or the archaic worldview, um, and generated skepticism. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to leave a lot of um, 
sort of skirmishing with bits of the secondary literature to footnotes. Um, uh, I think it's fair to say that Xenophanes has not been blessed with the, the, the most uh, insightful secondary literature uh, overall, and, and so it's not that rewarding to go into much of it in this sort of forum, but I'll, I'll allude to bits of uh, one or two issues. Let's consider the two steps in question in reverse order. Uh, so beginning with the second step, the undermining of faith and knowledge based on divine inspiration. Xenophanes rejected the traditional religion of Homer and Hesiod in a very radical and sweeping way. He rejected its anthropomorphism, um, fragments 14 to 16 and 23, including not only the conception that the gods are born and have bodies, speech and clothes like human beings, as fragment 14 specifies, but also its conception that the gods engage in such human vices as theft, adultery and deception, as fragments 11 to 12 say. One especially interesting part of uh, Xenophanes' case here was an observation that different peoples conceive the gods in incompatible ways in accordance with their own distinctive characteristics. For example, the Ethiopians conceive them as snub-nosed and black, but the Thracians as blue-eyed and red-haired. That's fragment 16. And... Um, a connected inference that if animals such as cattle, horses and lions were in the business of representing gods, they too would do the same. They would also represent their gods uh, as being but like themselves. This, this, this is fragment 15. Indeed, it seems clear that Xenophanes even rejected traditional religions polytheism that for him there was only one God, a God quite unlike human beings. And so fragment 23, despite all the rather unobvious uh, attempts at misinterpretation in the secondary literature, makes this rather clear. It says, one God, greatest among gods and men, in no way similar to mortals, either in body or in thought. And, um, yeah, um, few points about that. Let me indeed say one or two things about this. Um, greatest among gods and men. Yes, there's a plural there. Um, but this is a Homer Homeric formula to designate Zeus. And so this uh, plural really doesn't mean that, you know, that Xenophanes is a, a polytheist after all. It just means in, if, in part that he's identifying the one god he, start, he mentions with Zeus, in effect, partly, and also saying that he's the greatest God, the greatest thing, or the greatest being. Um, so that's uh, one uh, 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 issue that the, some of the secondary literature has made a, a complete hash of. Um, and then the, um, the, 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 the other points to be made in this connection, they're just worth making briefly, is that complementing this fragment, there are fragments, plenty of them actually, where um, Xenophanes is um, il trying to eliminate one by one the other gods, the other traditional gods. That's to say, explain them away as merely natural phenomena. So gods like Iris, the sun Helios, uh, the moon, and so on, earth, uh, planets, and so on. Um, these are all uh, uh, interpreted by him in terms as being merely natural phenomena. Clouds are his favoured um, uh, naturalistic explanation. These things are just clouds. Um, there's, there's, there are actually, there's more than one naturalising strategy, but they're all naturalising strategies. Somebody says fire or sparks of fire and so on. But, uh, so there are complementing the state, the, the, the positive statement of, of monotheism. Um, there are, uh, as one would expect if you were a monotheist, attempts to explain away the appearance of other gods. And uh, the last point on this issue, and then we can pass on. Um, it's not irrelevant that Plato in the Sophist and Aristotle in the Metaphysics interpret Xenophanes this way. And 
So, you know, I, I, I think the evidence for this monotheism is absolutely overwhelming. And in yet another departure from traditional religion, uh, Xenophanes held that this single god remained unmoving in the same place, this is fragment 26, and caused motion by the power of thought alone, this is fragment 25. For our purposes, though, here today, the most crucial aspect of Xenophanes' repudiation of traditional religion is that he rejected the archaic view that the gods communicate knowledge to human beings through poetry, prophecy, and so on, through other channels too. So there, there is no divine inspiration of human beings with knowledge on Xenophanes' theology. This interpretive claim um, is uh, rather controversial again, as most of what I'll be saying is, so let me illustrate it with some evidence, and I'll begin with the less compelling and proceed to the more compelling. Um, first of all, nowhere in the, in the extant fragments does Xenophanes endorse that archaic view. Secondly, um, he reproaches its paradigmatic representatives, Homer and Hesiod, for falsehood, fragment 11. Thirdly, Xenophanes, in an ex extant fragment, explicitly denies divinity to one of the gods who was traditionally most associated with the function of serving as a messenger between gods and men, namely Iris. So fragment 32 says, and she whom they call Iris, she too is actually a cloud. And of course, as a monotheist, you know, the implication is with, with these naturalizings of all the other pseudo-gods, um, that the other messengers of the gods, Hermes and all the rest of them, are, are not really messengers of the gods at all. Fourthly, and most tellingly of all, Xenophanes explicitly denies that the gods have communicated their omniscience to humans, saying that humans are instead reliant on themselves, on themselves for improving their grasp of the world, their cognitive grasp of the world. So, fragment 18 says, Yet the gods have not revealed all things to mortal from the beginning, but by seeking, men find out better in time. Again, the obvious interpretation of this fragment has been subjected to a lot of rather obtuse objections. Or he's only saying all things are not known by virtue of divine inspiration as one line in the secondary literature. As, as if I would, when I, as an atheist, would say, she thinks she knows about everything because she's read the Bible, I would be automatically conceding that she knows a lot from the Bible, uh, merely questioning whether she knows everything. Uh, so uh, the, the, the passage I suggest we read as it sounds. It's uh, saying that the gods do not give us uh, divinely inspire us with knowledge, we need to find it ourselves. Yet the gods have not revealed all things to mortal from the beginning, but by seeking, men find out better in time. In short, Xenophanes took step two. He cut away one of the two pillars under, uh, of the archaic epistemology, uh, knowledge through divine inspiration. Let's turn now to step one, um, the undermining of faith and the reliability of sense experience. It's often been argued in the, sec in the secondary literature, the modern secondary literature, I should uh, qualify, that Xenophanes' skepticism did not extend to claims based on sense experience. However, the balance of the evidence very strongly suggests that it did. Thus, a whole string of credible ancient authorities, who probably had considerably more evidence to draw on than we do, including Pseudo-Plutarch, Aristocles, Aetius, Sotion, and Sextus Empiricus, clearly assert or imply that it did. There's almost unanimity in antiquity that Xenophanes' position included this move. Moreover, strong evidence for this reading can also be found in the extant fragments themselves. In one fragment, Xenophanes seems to be offering an argument for skepticism concerning judgments about the sweetness of foodstuffs. So fragment 38 says, if gods had not created yellow honey, they, that's to say people, would have said that figs were far sweeter. 
And in another fragment, he seems to register a measure of skeptical detachment, even about his own age at the time of his exile from his native city of Colophon to a life of wandering, saying that he was 25, if indeed I am able to tell correctly of these matters. This is fragment eight. J. H. Lesher has pointed out in objection to this sort of reading that there are a number of passages that seem at first sight to speak against it, where he seems to be crediting himself with um, sensory knowledge. For example, Xenophanes refers in one fragment to, quote, the upper limit of the earth that is seen here at our feet. This is fragment B28. And in another, he encourages people to observe the multicolored rainbows, as B32. However, I suggest that the solution to this problem can be seen from Xenophanes' remark at fragment, fragment 8 concerning his own age, namely, if indeed I am able to tell correctly of these matters. And in his injunction in another fragment, this is fragment 35, let these, let these things be opined as resembling the truth. The solution is as follows. Although he is indeed skeptical that he knows about sensory matters, he nonetheless takes his impressions concerning them rather seriously in a way that he does not take the alleged deliverances of divine inspiration seriously, for example. Such a combination of global skepticism about the deliverances of divine inspiration, for that matter reason, and the deliverances of the senses, together with a certain privileging of the latter over the former, will later be characteristic of Peronian skepticism as well. Consider, for example, Sextus Empiricus's, Empiricus's account of the Pyrrhonist life of appearances in the outlines of, of Pyrrhonism. Indeed, when one remembers that the de facto founder of Pyrrhonism, Timon, in his poems about uh, Pyrrho, is known to have had a special fondness for Xenophanes' philosophy, it seems likely that Xenophanes was the original source of that Peronian stance. In short, Xenophanes took not only step two, but also step one, namely undermining the faith in the reliability of sense experience. Having thus effectively cut off both of the two archaic routes to knowledge, Xenophanes was driven with remarkable consistency to a general skepticism. This is shown by his most famous skeptical fragment of all, fragment 34. I'll quote it. And as for certain truth, no man has seen it, nor will there ever be a man who knows about the gods and about all the things I mention. For even if he succeeds to the fullest in saying what is completely true, he himself nevertheless fails to know it and opinion or seeming is wrought over all things. So that's my uh, reading of, of Xenophanes. Um, I'd like now, in continuation of this, um, this uh, 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 topic, to say a little about the relation of this form of philosophical skepticism that already arises in Xenophanes to skepticism in the strict sense, Pyrrhonism as it subsequently emerged in the 4th century BC and on. Um, I'm only going to say rather little. It's going to be a, more of a sketch, this part of the paper. I don't think that it would be plausible to claim that Xenophanes was simply a Pyrrhonist avant la lettre. For one thing, his whole dogmatic and novel theology is sharply at odds with the, the spirit of Pyrrhonism. For another thing, the sort of life in accordance with tentative beliefs and inquiry that he recommends is significantly different in spirit from, the Pyrrhon from Pyrrhonism's life by appearances. Whereas the former involves beliefs, albeit tentative ones, the latter does not. Whereas the former is a life lived in the hope of attaining or at least approximating the truth, the latter is not. So there's some variation 
that um, in the position that goes on as it's transmitted from Xenophanes to his Peronian successors. Nonetheless, I think it's plausible to see Xenophanes' position as a very important influence on Pyrrhonism. And the following are some of the main points I've noted in this connection. I'll list about six of them, go run through them rather quickly. As um, I've already mentioned, the de facto founder of Pyrrhonism, Timon, was an admirer of Xenophanes, who assigned to Xenophanes a respected and central role in his own Siloi, which was a, a type of satire, philosophical satire, um, which was indeed even as a genre borrowed from Xenophanes. Uh, secondly, Xenophanes' unrestricted forswearing of claims to knowledge, as expressed in fragment 34, the fragment I just quoted, coheres strikingly with the unrestricted renunciation of claims to knowledge found in Peronian scepticism. Accordingly, Sextus himself on occasion quotes fragment 34 with approval in this spirit. Renouncing claims to knowledge is of course not the same as denying you have knowledge. That's what the Peronists think the academic skeptics did wrongly. Thirdly, as was already mentioned, Xenophanes' recommendation that having forsworn claims to knowledge, we should let things be opined as resembling the truth, is very similar to the Pyrrhonist policy of living by appearances, even conceding that there is a residual difference between them concerning the avoidance of beliefs altogether. Moreover, given that Timon was evidently the person who introduced this policy in Pyrrhonism and that he was an admirer of Xenophanes, it's tempting to see Xenophanes as its original source. Note in particular the resemblance between Xenophanes' version of the recommendation in fragment 34, um, opinion or seeming is wrought over all things, that's the best we have to go by, and the earliest expression of the corresponding Peronian policy by Timon. Timon writes, but the appearance prevails everywhere wherever it goes. Fourthly, in fragment 18, yet the gods have not revealed all things to mortals from the beginning, but by seeking, men find out better in time. The word here translated by seeking is tseituntes, as from the verb tsetain, the verb Rachel was discussing earlier today, which is a verb that goes on to play a very central role in the Pyrrhonus life of, uh, ide the Pyrrhonus ideal of life, as, 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 as Rachel was discussing. Thus Sextus opens the outlines of Pyrrhonism, telling us that unlike dogmatists such as Aristotle, who think that they have discovered the truth, and academics such as Clytomachus and Carneades, who regard the truth as inapprehensible, <coughs> the skeptics keep on searching, say Tuzi. So here again, we find a striking similarity and a probable influence linking Xenophanes to the Pyrrhonists who came after him. Though this, of course, doesn't preclude a certain modification in the ideal being advocated of a sort I already implied above. Fifthly, Xenophanes' focus on opposed appearances in relation to different human races and potentially also different animals' representations of gods and in relation to the degree of sweetness that figs appear to people to have and the degree that they would appear to people to have if they were not acquainted, if people were not acquainted with honey, anticipates and probably influenced a similar focus on opposed appearances that is already implicit in Timon and Pyrrho and that becomes uh, more explicitly central in later Pyrrhonism, for example, in the Ten Tropes. Sixthly, and finally, more specifically, Xenophanes', Xenophanes example of the figs and honey um, which it can obviously be modified to call into question not only whether figs really have the sweetness they seem to have, but also whether honey does so, was probably the inspiration of a fragment in which Timon says, that honey is sweet, I do, do not affirm, but I agree that it appears so. And this was in its turn almost certainly the inspiration of the following famous example from Sextus Empiricus's outlines, quote the little passage, and when we question whether the underlying object is such as it appears, we grant the fact that it appears now doubt does not concern the appearance itself, but the account of that appearance. For example, honey appears to us to be sweet, 
and this we grant, for we perceive sweetness through the senses. But whether it is also sweet in its essence is for us a matter of doubt, since this is not an appearance but a judgment regarding the appearance. In short, not only was Xenophanes himself a fairly radical skeptic, but he also anticipated and influenced skepticism in the narrow, the strictest sense, Pyrrhonism, in a number of important ways. In sum, uh, for this part of the story, somewhat surprisingly, archaic culture already had a certain relatively clear, albeit naive, epistemology. Moreover, ironically enough, it was in a sense set up for a skeptical fall precisely because it did have such an epistemology. It would have been much less vulnerable to skepticism if it had not had it. By about the last third of the 6th century BC, the two assumptions that had, been, that had made knowledge possible according to that naive epistemology, the assumption of the availability of divine inspiration about the future, the unexperienced past, and the nonsensible, and the assumption of the usual reliability of sensory experience, had both been undermined, leading to a general skepticism. The person who took these steps was Xenophanes. By doing so, he anticipated and influenced skepticism proper, Pyrrhonism, in important ways. So I'm going to turn now to the other kind of skepticism, literary skepticism. Among the various forms of skepticism, in a broad sense, that were developed in antiquity, the earliest, though, was what I'm going to call literary skepticism. By this, I mean not a type of skepticism that was about literature, at least not essentially, but instead a type of literature that was exclusively or mainly developed by literature. And it's, I don't mean that it wasn't philosophical either. It's perhaps worth uh, stressing in this connection, not just for this particular case, but more broadly, that a lot of, a lot of the most interesting and uh, promising idea, philosophical ideas in antiquity actually are found in literature. If you want to know about morals, it's probably not a bad tip to put aside the ancient moral philosophers and go and read the tragedians, for example. This form of skepticism consists roughly in a concern that over and above the threat to human knowledge that's posed by routine human error, including error resulting from deliberate deception by other human beings, there is an even greater threat to human knowledge. Human beings may be deliberately deceived in important ways by the gods, and moreover, moreover often to their great harm. So this is the skeptical thought that I'm interested in, that people often are, in other cases maybe, deceived in important ways by the gods to their great detriment. As far as the available information allows us to judge, Homer is the earliest representative of this sort of skepticism. Book two of the Iliad is a locus classicus for it. For there, not only do we find examples of human error in general, including error due to human deception, for example, the Greek forces erroneous belief that they're about to go back to Greece, caused by Agamemnon's, Agamemnon's deliberate deception of them to that effect, namely in order to test them. But we also find a prime example of the gods deliberately deceiving human beings and moreover thereby harming human beings. Seus has already in book one accorded Achilles' mother Thetis their shared wish that the Greeks be driven back from Troy in order to punish Agamemnon for his insults to Achilles. And now in book two, Zeus prepares the ground for this punishment by sending to Agamemnon a personified deceptive dream who tells Agamemnon falsely that if he attacks Troy on that day, he will take it. A deception that eventually does lead, indeed lead to the Greeks being beaten back just as Achilles and Thetis Thetis had requested. Nor is this by any means the only example of the sort of skeptical concerning question in Homer. Indeed, in the very next book of the Iliad, book three, um, or rather, yeah, yeah, book three, we encounter another striking example of it when Helen, told by a thinly disguised Aphrodite 
to go to Paris in their bedroom, fears that the goddess is trying to deceive her and in particular to trick her into still further humiliating wanderings away from home. This sort of skeptical worry continues to play an important role in tragedy as well. For example, in Sophocles' Ajax, after Ajax has been cheated of the arms of Achilles by the two Atridae, Men Menelaus and Agamemnon, and Odysseus, and has conceived the plan of attacking them in revenge, Athena, in order to avenge a slight to her that uh, Ajax has committed, and in order to help her protege, Odysseus intervenes to frustrate Ajax's plan by deluding him into believing that the Greeks, cattle and sheep are his, hu are his human enemies, so that he attacks the cattle and sheep instead, a delusion which then leads to his deep shame and ultimately suicide. And Euripides in his Helen gives a reworking of the Homeric story of Helen along novel lines that had already be, been adumbrated by the poet Stesichorus, according to which Hera punishes Paris for his preference of Aphrodite over her in a contest for beauty by substituting an illusory Helen for the real one whom he has taken from Greece uh, and sending the real one to, uh, to, to Egypt a deception that afflicts not, only, afflicts not only Paris himself, but also the other Trojans and the Greeks, all of whom are caused by it to undergo great and pointless suffering. This general theme of deliberate divine deception of human beings to their detriment also undergoes some interesting variations. For example, already in Hesiod, we find a variation according to which the divine muses um, sometimes deceive. Thus, in the, in the Theogony, uh, Hesiod has the muses whom he encounters on Mount Helicon to inspire himself say, we know how to speak many false things as though they were true, but we know when we will to utter true things. <coughs> and perhaps the most extraordinary variation of all uh, is found in Sophocles' play Oedipus Rex. There, the theme of God's deliberately deceiving human beings and thereby harming them remains fundamental, but the theme is varied in some very unusual and interesting ways. For one thing, the main instruments of the deception are certain oracles which are actually true, specifically the oracle to Laius, that he will, king of Thebes, that he will be killed by his son, and the oracle to Oedipus, his son, that he will kill his father and sleep with his mother. That's a bad hair day, if ever there was one. The deceptiveness lies not in the falsehood of the oracles, but instead in the fact that they are communicated in contexts that inevitably lead their recipients into various misunderstandings and errors, which bring about the oracle's fulfillment and thereby the recipient's downfall. Thus Laius, in reaction to the oracle that he receives, orders that his infant son Oedipus be, Oedipus be killed, which in fact leads to Oedipus being spared by a compassionate servant who's charged with the task and given away to Corinth, whence he eventually returns to Thebes and does indeed kill Laius. And similarly Odysseus, when he receives his oracle in Corinth, assumes that it's referring to the royal couple there who, unbeknownst to him, adopted him in his infancy and therefore are merely his adoptive parents. And he consequently reacts by leaving Corinth for Thebes in order to avoid killing and sleeping with them, which eventually leads to him killing his natural father and sleeping with his natural mother in Thebes. For another thing, that's one of the peculiarities. They're actually true, these oracles. For another thing, Oedipus is an unusually intelligent man. In particular, a man who, received, who solved the riddle, of the, the riddle of the Sphinx and thereby won the throne of Thebes. These two unusual features of the Oedipus Rex together generate a particularly frightening version of the skeptical concern that I'm interested in showing both that the god's deception can take uh, endlessly devious, sophisticated, and ironic forms, and that even the most intelligent of human beings can be tricked and brought down by them. 
Literary skepticism is very different from the various forms of philosophical skepticism that arose in antiquity. For example, with Xenophanes or Parmenides or Protagoras, you can think of his uh, relativism as a, in the broad sense, a type of skepticism. Socrates, the Pyrrhonists, the academic skeptics, and so on. It's different not only in its source, namely literature rather than philosophy, but also in its content and character. For one thing, whereas the philosophical forms of skepticism are usually very broad or even unrestricted in scope, literary skepticism is limited in scope, concerning only certain people on certain occasions and in relation to certain topics. For another thing, whereas the philosophical forms of skepticism employ special types of argument in order to motivate their doubts and denials, such as Parmenides' paradox of not being and its various applications in his poem, Soc Socrates' Elenchus, or the Pyrrhonist method of equipollence, this literary skepticism does not, unless one counts the mere phenomenon of deception by very clever and powerful gods as a special type of argument. For yet another thing, whereas the philosophical forms of skepticism do not involve any deliberate deception of human beings, Socrates' skepticism arguably again comes close to being an exception, um, as in some of these other cases, literary skepticism does not. So there's no deliberate deception, uh, deception typically in the philosophical cases by a god, but in the literary case there is. After, fl after flourishing in the tragedy of the 5th century BC, literary skepticism seems to have virtually died out by the 4th century. This was probably in part due to the widespread displacement of traditional conceptions of the gods by, in certain cases, outright agnosticism or atheism, Protagoras and Critias as cases in point, and more commonly, the less anthropocentric, more abstract conceptions of God or gods that philosophers such as Xenophanes had introduced. It was probably also partly due to the sort of attack on the conception that gods lie or deceive that one already finds in Xenophanes and then later in Plato's Republic, an attack that in turn drew on a more general aversion to lying and deception that had grown in the 6th century and the 5th centuries, uh, fifth century. So in contra that in contrast to Homer's uh, Odyssey where the work's hero, Odysseus, is a striking embodiment of these traits of lying and deceiving. By the time Sophocles wrote his Philoctetes in the fifth century, both the traits themselves and Odysseus as their representative had instead come to be despised. So th this is probably why literary skepticism uh, uh, tends to disappear in the fourth century. However, literary skepticism subsequently re-emerged as a sort of late after echo in Christianity. For there a variant of it uh, occurs, not indeed in relation to God as before, but instead in relation to the devil and his minions, who are similarly believed to be disposed to deliberately deceive human beings and to thereby cause their downfall. In order to bring out the historical continuity a little more clearly, it's perhaps, perhaps worth noting in this connection that the New Testament's work for, word for a demon, daimon, had originally just been the pagan Greek's most general word for a god. It's a point that is worth noting in many connections, um, but in this one as well. Descartes subsequently drew on this Christian after echo in the form of his malin genie or evil demon in the first meditation in order to formulate his own version of skepticism as a prelude to then of course diffusing it. In, all, in contrast to philosophical skepticism which still remains very much a, a living topic or a living possibility today Literary skepticism might seem to have been completely superseded by now and to have no more than historical interest today since we no longer believe in gods, at least not if we're well informed and sensible, let alone in deceptive or malicious ones. However, I want to suggest that on the contrary, a closely analogous type of skepticism should still trouble us today. 
For we should still be very worried indeed that the world contains, if not quite superhuman beings and purposes, then at least superhuman or super individual mechanisms that have a quasi purpose, uh, namely a functional character, and which cause human beings to hold erroneous beliefs, moreover, often to their harm. Let me therefore try to sketch a, a, a case for this sort of skeptical worry in three parts. Uh, and the first part will be about the erroneous beliefs, the second part about the functional mechanisms, and the third part about the harm. I'll run through this fairly quickly. Um, just, I just want to convey the sense that this is by no means a sort of uh, 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 passé uh, 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 scepticism if you abstract from the details of it. Generically, it's still very much relevant. So, about the erroneous beliefs, it seems plausible to say that human beings not only sometimes have false beliefs, but that indeed most human beings are the victims of serious errors most of the time. This seems to be an implication, for example, of the discrepancy between what Wilfred Sellers has called the manifest image of everyday beliefs and the scientific image. Um, I mean, a lot of philosophy, of course, is modern philosophy has been trying to sort of argue there's no ir irreconcilability between the two and so on, but on the face of it, that's not right, and probably at the end of the day, it's not right. Some plausible examples of the sorts of serious errors in question um, are the following. Belief in God or gods or in a god, relatedly belief in a, an afterlife and the kind of soul or mind that could live in an afterlife, Relatedly, again, belief in elaborate myths about the gods uh, or God and about an afterlife, including, uh, for example, pagan myths, but also the equally fanciful myths of the Abrahamic religions. Related, relatedly, again, belief in much of theology and metaphysics. Relatedly, again, belief in the purposiveness of non-human nature, which has been thoroughly discredited since Kant and Darwin. Belief that the earth is the center of the universe, that was discredited by Copernicus. Belief in the solidity of macrophysical objects, that was arguably discredited by modern physics due to the wide spacing of such object, objects molecules, as Bertrand Russell pointed out, alluded to that yesterday. Belief in the objectivity of secondary qualities, such as colors, smells, and tastes, again arguably discredited by physics. Belief in the objectivity of moral and aesthetic qualities, as Hume argued, uh, these are more plausibly seen as subject dependent in a manner similar to secondary qualities. Belief that our conscious intentions are the real causes of our actions. This has been plausibly called into question by the experiments of Benjamin Libet, which seem at least to show that brain events that occur shortly before conscious intentions are always the real causes of actions. Belief in some sort of sup objective superiority of one's own nation over other nations. Belief in some sort of objective superiority of the individual human beings whom one loves, in particular one's own lover and one's own children over other human beings. Belief in some sort of objective superiority of human beings over other animals, or animals as we like to say and uh, belief in various fictions about politics, the law, and the economy, such as that human beings have natural rights and that commodities have intrinsic values. That's to say, fictions of the sort that Marx identified in his theory of ideology. So that's a sort of little list to give, give, give the flavor of the kinds of grounds one might have for saying that we're, most of us are the victims of pretty serious uh, errors, uh, cognitive errors, most of the time. Secondly, to go on to the, the functional mechanisms, it seems plausible to say that these errors are at least enabled and in many cases outright caused by superhuman or at least super individual mechanisms, which, if not exactly purposive, at least have a certain functional character. Two such mechanisms are First of all, evolution by natural selection, and secondly, social ideology. 
So let me say a little about each of these mechanisms and their role in turn. First of all, evolution. Much evolutionary epistemology has been optimistic in character in a certain sense. It assumes that human beings possess lots of knowledge and then attempts to explain this supposed fortunate condition in terms of evolution by natural selection. Conrad Lorenz's attempt to explain our supposed synthetic a priori knowledge as an innate, an innate uh, acquisition due to evolution by natural selection is an example of this. In some version or other, such an optimistic account is probably part of the truth about the relation between evolution and cognition. But if one keeps in mind, as one should, the sort of massive incidence of erroneous belief among human beings that I just sketched, it becomes very attractive to complement such an optimistic account with a more pessimistic one. Evolution by natural selection also en enables, or outright causes, much error. One might recall here Hesiod's muses, who sometimes inspire human beings with truths, but sometimes with errors. Consider, first of all, the enabling. Even in cases where evolution's requirement of adaptiveness does not straightforwardly cause erroneous beliefs, it may nonetheless be, as it were, indifferent to them or they to it in a way that leads it to generate what you might call a space in which they can just as well occur as true beliefs. In this connection, one crucial point to note, I think, is the following. Since it's, um, since it's in the end only our physical behavior that either contributes to uh, or under, uh, contributes to or undermines our fitness for survival, evolution's requirement of adaptiveness only, as it were, cares about what might be called the extensional reliability of beliefs, not about what might be called their intentional reliability. That's a little bit obscure, so let me give an example that's supposed to make that distinction between extensional reliability and intentional and uh, a clearer and to illustrate the point. It may be very important for the fitness of individuals for survival in a rainforest that they eat plant species X, which is nutritious, but avoid eating plant species Y, which is poisonous, and therefore that they be, a they be able to make judgments that discriminate between the two species and which identify X as a species to be eaten, but Y as a species to be avoided. But from the point of view of fitness for survival, it may be a matter of complete indifference whether they achieve this feat by conceiving of the X's as a nutritious plant species and the Y's as a poisonous plant species, or instead by conceiving of the X's as a tribe of friendly plant gods and the Y's as a tribe of uh, hostile plant gods. Concerning next evolution by natural selection, sometimes outright causing erroneous beliefs, it seems plausible to hypothesize that the erroneous beliefs that occur among human beings are, in certain cases at least, in one way or another, more adaptive than corresponding true beliefs would be, and that this is a large part of the explanation why they occur. For example, a belief in gods or a god, especially when accompanied by a belief in an afterlife, may ward off the anxiety, despair, depression, demotivation that tends to result from recognition of the reality of an indifferent, dangerous, deadly world, and may thereby support the sort of persistent, determined action by an individual that optimizes his, and her, his or her own and his or her genetic relative's chances for survival. Similarly, belief in the objective superiority of one's own nation over other nations or of one's own loved ones over other individuals may spur one, spur one to the sort of determined action on their behalf in the competition with other nations or individuals that gives oneself and one's genetic relatives the best chance of survival and flourishing. Similarly, belief in the objective superiority of human beings over animals or other animals may encourage the sort of ruthless exploitation of other animals that gives human beings and their genetic relatives the best chance of survival and reproduction. 
Similarly, belief in objective moral facts may encourage the sort of self-sacrifice and altruism by an individual in the interest of his family and community that, on balance, maximize the chance that his or her his, his genes will survive, whether in his own person or in his genetic relatives. Similarly, belief in objective aesthetic characteristics uh, in particular beauty and ugliness, probably has its origin in the area of sexual attraction, as Kant was at pains to deny, but Darwin and Nietzsche both saw, where it serves to identify and attract an individual to reproductively optimal partners and to identify and repel an individual from reproductively suboptimal partners, thereby increasing the probability of the survival of his genes. Uh, so that's a sketch of how the story might go for evolution. Now, so, social ideology. Another superhuman, or at least superindividual mechanism possessing a functional character that, possesses, that produces illusions is social ideology, roughly in Marx's sense of the term. In Marx's original conception, this is a matter of the class structure of society generating illusions in such areas as religion, philosophy, law, politics, economics, morality, and art, which serve certain class interests, especially uh, typically those of the ruling class, over against others, typically those of the working class, or the oppressed class, and of the illusions in, que illusions in question, moreover, in some sense, being generated in order to serve those interests. What that in order ultimately means is very much a... Uh, 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 secondary, sec uh, a topic of secondary interest for, for, the, for our purposes. For example, on Marx's account, Christian religion projects human beings' highest qualities and potentials away from human beings themselves and instead onto an illusory God, thereby reconciling the members of an oppressed working class to their oppressed, unfulfilled condition by making that condition seem metaphysically inevitable and so making them accept it instead of rebelling against it. And Christian religion also promises the extravagant rewards in an illusory afterlife for a self-sacrificing existence in this life, thereby further reconciling the working class to their oppressed, unfulfilled condition, and so making them accept it instead of rebelling against it. Bruno Bauer very plausibly suggested a third mechanism in this area as well, Christian religion also posits a God who not only approves of hierarchical socio-political relations between a ruling and a ruled class in the human sphere, but also himself models such relations in his own relationship to that whole sphere, thereby still further reconciling the working class to their oppressed, unfulfilled condition, and so making them accept it instead of rebelling against it. Marx gives similar and similarly plausible accounts of illusions in other cultural areas uh, as well, philosophy, law, politics, economics, moral morality, and art. Moreover, as I've argued in more detail somewhere else, uh, Marx's conception of social ideology can also plausibly be extended to group conflicts other than class conflicts, for example, to national conflicts, and indeed even to species conflicts, conflicts between different species. For such conflicts similarly generate illusions that serve the interests of one of the competing groups against those of the other, and um, which arise in order to do so, albeit that in this case, the emphasis is less, as in, it mainly is with Marx, on the illusions uh, um, among the victims of the oppression or the, uh, 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 the less advantaged side than on the uh, illusions, than on illusions in the victimizers, which encourage them in their victimizing. For example, both crude conceptions of national superiority and more sophisticated conceptions of it, such as Aristotle's theory in the politics, that whereas the northern barbarians have spirit but not intelligence and the eastern barbarians have the converse, the Greeks have both and are therefore superior to and ought to rule over the barbarians, um, were falsehoods that served to promote the interests of one nation against another and which arose in order to do so. And common western religious and philosophical conceptions, including 
among philosophers today, according to which there's some sort of deep qualitative gulf separating human beings from all the other animals, which makes human beings superior to all the other animals, are falsehoods that serve the interests of human beings against those of the other animals by licensing human beings' ruthless exploitation of the other animals and which arise in order to do so. Uh, the third component was that the, these functional mechanisms producing illusions often do so to the detriment or to the harm of the people who uh, uh, are uh, uh, the victims of the illusions. Finally, uh, so finally this third part, um, very much as, the ancient, as ancient literary skepticism implied, the illusions that are generated by the mechanisms of evolution and so social ideology may often be harmful, even disastrous, for those who entertain them. Concerning evolution, since adaptiveness is a matter of the statistical probability that a trait will be advantageous for the reproduction of genes within a particular environment, it does not preclude that that, that, um, that, that trait will result in genetic disaster for particular individuals, nor even for all individuals should the environment change. Think of the dinosaurs, for example. Consequently, the mere fact that evolution by natural selection produces such common illusions as that of the objective superiority of one's own nation over other nations or of the individuals whom one loves over other individuals in no way precludes the possibility, even the likelihood, um, that these illusions will produce genetic disasters in individual cases. Think of the many family tragedies that result from the possessiveness and jealousy arising from that illusion, for example. Or even for all individuals. Imagine, for example, that in the new environment constituted by the invention of atomic weapons, nationalism leads to an atomic war that destroys the whole human species. Moreover, genetic success or failure, while no doubt related to, is something significantly different from success or failure in terms of the values that human beings consciously espouse. So that even genetic successes may still be human disasters and vice versa, of course. Concerning ideology, the corresponding point is even more obvious. For example, already on Marx's original theory, the Christian religious illusions that the mechanism of ideology generates are severely contrary to the interests of at least the majority of people who believe them, namely the working class. In short, the literary skepticism of the ancients is not nearly as passé as it might seem. While its religious framework has of course been superseded, this does not prevent a fairly close secular analogue of literary scepticism from still being very much a matter for serious concern. So in sum, Homer made at least two, at least two important contributions to the development of scepticism. He articulated the naive epistemology that provoked Xenophanes' attack on it, thereby leading to the emergence of philosophical scepticism, and he himself developed literary scepticism. Thanks.